under the first division, Nebuchadnezzar's vision and reign. We've had his fearful dream. That's the main heading, and now A, B, C, D, and D is chapter 2, verses 19 through 45. We looked at Daniel's praise in verse 19 through 23, Daniel's prologue in verse 24 through 30. Now 3, Daniel's proclamation in verses 31 through 45. Now here I believe that we have a twofold division, and then... Um, uh, it would look as though that uh, most of you have got that. Yeah, you do. First of all, the dream, uh, and it's and the, the 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 dream with reference to the image, and it is an image of a great man. Now, in verse one, I'm sorry, in verse thirty-one. You have its character, and now you, you should you should look at this, and you should uh, observe that its character is a key to the understanding of the image. All right, its character is twofold. First, it is fabulous or excellent, and secondly, it's fearful or terrible. Now. You need to know that in verse 31 because you have here its character from man's point of view and you have its character from God's point of view. In verse 31, <coughs> this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form there was terrible. From man's point of view, it's great. From God's point of view, it's terrible. Now, uh, Nebuchadnezzar isn't going to appreciate the fact that it's terrible. But I'll tell you, from God's point of view, it is terrible because we're going to see its interpretation a little bit. Now then, it's composition <coughs> in verses 32 through 33. Actually, its composition is fivefold with the last two uh, more or less just thrown, uh, more or less developing together. All right, you have its head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. In its composition, Please observe something. It just becomes increasingly degenerate. He doesn't start from the feet to the head. He starts from the head to the feet. Because of the representation of this particular image. The head is gold. The breast and arms silver. Belly and thighs, brass, legs, iron, feet, notice what they are, part iron and part clay. The legs, in light of the metal, carry right on through to the feet. But when you get to the feet, there's a foreign element that's involved in the feet. This has great significance, as we shall see very shortly. Now then, in verses 34 through 35, you have its calamity. You didn't get number three, did you? It's calamity. It's character, it's composition, it's calamity. Now then, <coughs> let me ask you a question before I go on. 
What is your understanding at this juncture of the image? Meaning what? But what does this what does this image in your understanding represent before we go on? Including Nebuchadnezzar, right? The kingdoms which gives you the full course of the times of the Gentiles. You got your little card there? I want you to see that. <laughs> see the green line? The green line represents the Gentile stream of humanity. Now, prior to the Gold Mountain, the Gentile stream of humanity is subservient or underneath the red line representing the Jewish line of humanity until you come to the Babylonian kingdom, the mountain of gold. Now then, here is where you have the Gentiles in the place of ascendancy in the sense that the Gentile kingdoms are used of God to chasten the Jewish line of humanity. Now that green line continues right on through to the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Do you see that? Now that's called the times of the Gentiles. Now these four metals and clay denote the kingdoms from Babylon to the second advent of Christ. Do you see that? Well, you've got to see that. But what you do see is you see now in verses 34 through 40, 34 through 35, the calamity of the Gentile kingdoms. Now, what causes the calamity? Hmm? What causes the calamity? But according to the biblical text, what causes the calamity? What destroys? All right, it's a, an un, uncut stone, isn't that right? The little stone brings to an end the Gentile kingdoms. Now then, <coughs> in this, in the two verses, verses 34 and 35, the little stone then that brings to an end these metals. I'm told something happens in its destructing of the kingdoms. It then becomes what? What does it say? Look at your Bibles. Tracy, what does it say? It then becomes what? What, the little stone? The image becomes chaff, isn't that right? Okay, then what happens with reference to the little stone? Huh? And does what? All right. It fills the whole earth. This little stone displaces all of the other metals. And it becomes that element which fills the whole earth. 
Do you see that? So, you not only have the calamity of the image, but you have the commencement of a little stone which becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. So in your diagram of the chart, gold, silver, brass, iron, and iron and clay goes off the scene. And then that little stone becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. And that's what you've got in that white mountain. Okay. That ought to tell you something that the Gentile world is over with. I am, I'm just so excited I can hardly stand it. I think we're through with the iron. Uh, I think we're through with the iron. I think we're living in the feet days, frankly. And the feet which we see here, that's a little bit later. It is amazing. Okay, now then, let's go on. The dreams interpretation. We've had the dreams image in verses 31 through 35, and then you have the dreams interpretation in verses 36 through 45. Now then, number one, in verses 36 to 38, I am told what the head is. <coughs> it represents the Babylonian kingdom. Now I have in the margin of my notes Gentile beginnings. Outside of verse 36 to 38 were gold, Babylonian kingdom, had its beginning in 605 B.C. In relationship to Israel. Actually, the Babylonian kingdom came into being before that. Do you remember the little book of Jonah? Where was Jonah commissioned to go and preach? What was Nineveh? Huh? No. No. Where was Nineveh? Well, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Miles, but I'm talking about where was Nineveh in relationship to the Gentile world? Well, yeah, if you can tell me. And north and west of it. Because east would be going into Iran. Now, what was Nineveh then? Besides being a city. Any of you know? Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. Do you remember reading in the book of Kings, in the book of Chronicles, such names as Esharhaddon, Sennacherib, Shalmaneser, Sargon. Remember that? Those names? Those were Assyrian generals or leaders. They were the ones that God used in 721 B.C. to come down and take the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. The Assyrians. Very malicious people. I had a <coughs> I had a history teacher in college that had taken a trip to those areas long before World War II. He was very interested in archaeology. And um, he went to a museum someplace, I forget where it was, and there was a hideous statue. And that statue was of a man. 
And that statue of a man was a man that was skinned. And he skinned. Gruesome. See all the blood vessels and muscles and all of that, you know, protruding. Walked around that thing, looked at it. And that was a statue commemorating the brutality of the Assyrians. They often skinned their captives alive. Oh, they were, they were loving people. Jonah, go preach to those pagan Gentiles. Uh, Nana was over there in the end, so Jonah went this way. Very obedient. And he had to have a case of fishology before it changed his mind. And then he went to Nineveh, and he preached, and the whole city of Nineveh was converted. Gentile people. And this good Jew pouted. He went outside and pouted because God had saved some Gentiles. John was a rascal. Now then, in 612, you remember this, 612 B.C., <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar, apparently the general of the army of the Babylons went up and sacked Nineveh destroyed the capital of the Assyrian kingdom and you look on your little card the green mountain represents the Assyrian kingdom okay so when Babylon became the mistress of the world, then God used Babylon in 605 to go and sack Jerusalem to take care of the southern rebels of Israel. All right? Now well, that's pretty important for the book of Daniel. Now then, number two, in verse 39a, the first part of verse 39, you have the Medio Persia kingdom. Silver. Silver. It had its beginning approximately 539 B.C. Five thirty nine BC. Now number four in parentheses in verses forty through forty three. <coughs> you have when I just gave you I just gave you two. Back to three three in parentheses. Verse 39b, you have the Grecian kingdom, that's the brass. It had its beginning around 330 B.C. All you've heard of Alexander the Great, isn't that right? 330 B.C. Now, you have much to thank Alexander the Great for right today particular next class period. He was a Greek and he introduced Greek culture to the world. Huh? And he was. <laughs> he was a very godless fellow. He swept through the then known world. Everything fell. Everything fell. 
And with the fall of everything, got over there at Babylon, and there are the Chaldees. <coughs> and he could conquer the world militarily, but he couldn't conquer his godless passion and appetite. And he died a very godless, licentious death. And later on in the book of Daniel, we'll find out the consequences of that. All right, now then, four in the parentheses, verses 40 through 43. <laughs> Make sure to put your verse 40 in there, in your outline there. 40 through 43. Here you have Rome introduces this fourth kingdom. Now please note what I said. Rome introduces this fourth kingdom. Again, look at your little chart. You see the color of that thing? I didn't give you nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now notice the color. You can't see it. Well, you can. Huh? That's right. You should. <laughs> All right. The color is the same, isn't it? From there right to the destruction. Rome introduces this fourth kingdom. Now this fourth kingdom is noted by its characteristic. Now Rome had its beginning out to the side. This is iron and iron clay. In 146 B.C., those are the dates that I learned. Dr. Wolbert gives the dates. 202 B.C. And I learned that Rome had its beginning with the Battle of Carthage and the Battle of Corinth. In 146 B.C., Rome then broke the backbone of all of the previous Kingdoms. She became mistress of the world. Now then, five in parentheses, <coughs> verses 44 through 45. And here you have God's kingdom. Here's the little stone. Now then in verses 44 and 45, you have the consummation or the end of the 70th week. Do you understand that right now? Put that down, the end of the 70th week. Because you're going to note that in the ninth chapter. So the interpretation of this image relates to Gentile kingdoms from the beginning of the Babylonian captivity in 605 B.C. clear to the end of the second advent of Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth that's going to fill the whole earth. Now there's two little things I want you to see here in the last part of verse 45. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. <coughs> now 
<clears throat> I just overheard a little of your previous class. Your all millennials in their principal interpretation denies both those things. That the dream is certain and the interpretation sure. Now listen, kids. Daniel wrote this. Daniel wrote this during the Babylonian captivity. Remember that? He was in Babylon as a captive, right? He lived to see the Medio Persia kingdom come on the scene. He did not live to see the Grecian kingdom come, nor did he live to see the Roman kingdom enter in to destroy. Let me ask you this. Did, did the Grecian kingdom come? Did Rome displace it? Yes. It is sure. Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome. Now, if those are sure, and they are by revelation and by history, you may rest assured that number five, the kingdom of God on earth is going to be just as sure and just as certain. Now, I'll tell you, we are down at the feet. I'm going to read verses 42 and 43. You get your Bibles out there and, and pay strict attention. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, what does this indicate? It indicates confusion. It indicates corruption. It indicates there's lots of power, but that power isn't going to stick together. Did you hear what happened in the Senate of Canada yesterday? Well, in the center of Canada yesterday, the liberals endeavored to sack the GST. <coughs> now, I'm not too much in favor of that GST either. But, do you know what those idiots did? What they've been doing for some time now. They've been filibusting. Now they went in to the Senate chamber yesterday. Into our legislative body. To bring about the passage of this bill. But. Instead of the legislature acting decently and in order. They just raised cane. Cat calls, yell, scream, read off lists. Such confusion that for two hours the man tried to bring order and he couldn't do it because of the disorder, okay? Oh, and we are a great orderly democracy. What has happened all over the world this last year? Disorderliness. What's happening in Russia today? Disorderliness. What's happening in the Western Hemisphere? Disorderliness. Confusion, corruption. What happened? 
What happened yesterday at the boat? Steel plant. Hmm? They turned it down. Two to one. Those characters got on the phone and had a telephone. Calling the membership to vote against it. Do you realize what they did? They voted not to get paid. Oh no. Now snowballs are not a very good diet. But they persuaded enough men in that silly thing to vote against. I don't care how corrupt that contract was. To think that a group of people could persuade you and persuade me to vote against a paycheck. Now, I'm going to tell you that something in there. To so corrupt the mind. If the news is right, right today they're starting to winterize that plant. Right today. Right today. And those that persuaded you, oh, they won't do that. They won't. You see, they were gambling. Folks, we're in the feet. Confusion, disorderliness, corruption. Yet there's real power. Look at that whippersnapper over there in Iraq. He stalled the whole world, hasn't he? He sure has. And you kids, you don't realize it possibly, but you're going to pay for it. <clears throat> Go out here and try to get a job. Hmm? Just try to get a job for too long. If this whole thing keeps up, try to get it. And boy, when you don't have a job, already cars are being, what do you call it, taken back, reclaimed, what is that? Repossessed. Repossessed. There's some houses now going under. Why, oh, you've got the mafia at the head of these things. Those guys still get there. I feel so bad. I feel so sorry for our workers that I can hardly stand it. But what you've got, you've got. Absolutely you have. Everything working out just fine. You kids better heed something. You better believe you had. Heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Commercial battle. <coughs> we live in the world, but I guarantee you we better not be partakers of it. And you just wait and see how many Christians will fall. How many Christians will knuckle under? How many Christians will compromise? Hmm? Partake of her evil deeds. <coughs> okay, now, Ian, your outline. The fruitful display. Chapter 2, verses 46 through 49. Now then you have in verse 46.
Okay. The king's reaction. And in the king's reaction, he gives adoration to Daniel. In verse 47, you have the king's reply. King answered and Daniel said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal his secret. In the king's reply, he makes an announcement. Recognizing that God is omnipotent and omniscient. Then number three, the king's reward in verses 48 and 49. And in the king's reward, he makes appointment, appointments of special dignity for Daniel and the three friends. So you have the king's reaction in his adoration, you have the king's reply in his announcement, and you have the king's reward in his appointment. Now that takes us to chapter 3. Now you guys make sure that you have this all done for me. For Thursday, right? That's our, that's our time. Finish chapter 4, because you'll just move right along. Finish chapter 4. Yeah, we'll have to have it, because we've got chapter 3, and chapter 4 isn't very long. I want, that, I want those outlines all done for me, okay? And incidentally, I just might decide to give you a quiz. Yeah, I might. Be an catastrophe. Yeah, yeah. You might have a terrible catastrophe. You might get side sidetracked. Yeah. Yeah.